can't see comments. Where is it? Hello! Welcome, everybody! Ah, there's some comments coming in. I was like, it's so quiet! Quiet here on the racetrack. Yes, we're here again on the racetrack because it is NaNoWriMo this month. And so we are talking about productivity and getting quicker with our writing. But also, we know around this time, we're getting into the second week of NaNoWriMo and things start to get a little bit rough. People start to hit their walls. They start to feel like, I don't know if I know where the story is going. You maybe haven't gotten past the first act yet in terms of your writing, but you're heading in that direction and you can feel that looming. So today we're going to talk about the middle, the middle of the book. And uh, often people talk about the sagging middle or the muddy middle or all of that stuff. Uh, I often think that middles are about the toughest thing to write. I don't know. What do you think, Gareth? Do you think middles are tough to write? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the time, certainly when something comes to my mind, I'll, I'll generally see the opening and the ending quite a lot. I think, um, you know, I'll go out on a limb and say many people are probably the same. What gets you excited is either a snippet or it's going to be the opening, a kind of really good setup um, and potentially a really good ending where you see how things would end. And that is really exciting and good. And it's like, okay, well, now I need to fill in everything in between. And uh, yeah, you know, they say the sagging middle, it's like, the middle of the week as well. Everybody calls Wednesday hump day. You just got to get over it. <laughs> I don't think yep. the same thing applies trying to put a story down to the middle is the, is the rough spot. Yep. So as we go through, feel free to share uh, some of the concerns that you have either in the middle or maybe, I don't know what you're just working on with nano right now. Um, we have uh viewers i don't remember what to say it's like guest viewers participants we have viewers <laughs> from all over uh michigan las vegas hawaii cold this morning in hawaii i find that very hard to believe what is that like 70 degrees i'm just kidding uh <laughs> spain atlanta um oh i like this the problem I have is how much to actually put in the middle. That is a good question, right? Pacing-wise, what are we looking for in a middle? And we will talk about that. Uh, somebody was asking, is this recorded? Yes, this is recorded. So feel free. And you said, can you ask questions? Go ahead and put the question in the chat. We'll answer it. And uh, you can always watch it later. Uh, if you can't, we'll watch it now. But uh, I have a few different tips. But yes, we are speaking of NaNoWriMo. In case you aren't aware of how NaNoWriMo works, uh, people are trying to work, write 50,000 words in the month of November. Quite a task. That's about 1666 words a day. So I'm curious, how's everybody doing so far? Those of you who are working on NaNoWriMo, what's your what's your progress like? Are you uh, keeping up with the keeping up with the thing? <laughs> keeping up with the flow? If not, maybe we'll give you some ideas and we can get yourself back on track. So, one thing that I'd like to talk about when it comes to the middle is starting in a good place. Try to make sure your transition to the middle is solid. Now, uh, we often at Autocrit like to talk about it similar to they do in um, screenwriting, where we talk about a three-act structure. And so the middle is that second act. And so this is after the protagonist has gotten what we call the call to adventure, and uh, they have decided to engage themselves in the story, uh, go and try to face off against the antagonist or a major obstacle, things like that. And what I think really helps in terms of getting your middle nice and solid is to start with that transition being nice and solid. Um, make sure that you've set those stakes clear to the audience, what the protagonist is getting themselves into, uh, the what the obstacle might be. If you have that in place, it's easier to at least transition and get off to a good foot. What do you think, Gareth, in terms of that that handoff from Act 1 to Act 2? Yeah, it's often uh, one of the tips that, that I like to keep in mind here is uh, one that I believe Rian Hall actually uh, promotes herself and finds really good too, is to keep in mind the imagery of a doorway, um, mm. busy for what they are, because the transition from Act 1 into Act 2 is stepping into the, you know, taking on the challenge and stepping into a different world. You're going on the quest. And that's the moment uh, that transition is when your main character says, yes, I'm going to go and we're going to enter into this new world. And I was thinking about that essence of when a character steps through a doorway in some 
uh, in a literary sense, they are transitioning into a different place. Right. Um, that's always how it feels metaphorically. So I like to keep yeah. that in mind. That's just one tip I think to myself is if I'm not really um, making it clear that this is the transition or it doesn't feel quite like the transition, I'll think of a way to have them go through something, walk, literally walk through something mm -hmm. like a, a, a gateway or it could be the, the big, um, what do you call them? Uh, I'm running out of words now. My brain is freezing, but the the big things in like Golden Guy in Tokyo, you know, the, the you walk underneath and you walk through. So there's always some kind of physical transition that happens that gives you that subtle sense that yeah, this is where we're moving into to somewhere else. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to catch up here in the chat with the progress. Look like we have some great progress. 15,405 words, 15,400 words, 10,000. 39% of the 80,000 word goal. Wow, I'm incredibly impressed there. 24,000. I like it's like struggling. 24,000. We have we have very <laughs> um, <laughs> productive writers around here. 7,000, 3,000 words so far. So quite a range. That's great. 50% uh, of 90,000. Wow. Woo. Uh, Ooh, example wow, would be Harry Potter arriving at Hogwarts. That's an excellent example. Fantastic. You are correct. Uh, that is definitely the transition. Or you maybe could go even a little bit further back. There's like a couple transitions in that book because he also does go through that portal uh, in um, King's Cross Station. So it's kind of like there's a little bit of a transition and then there's an even bigger transition. But yes, obviously. And then there maybe you can even go to Diagon Alley. So it's like a couple of steps, right? It just keeps getting grander and grander. And that's a way to uh, make things interesting. But I would say, yeah, the true in earnest handoff is around the time he arrives at hogwarts yeah it's, it's similar uh, to the kind of thing if you imagine a setup where the inciting incident is something that happens that <clears throat> beckons a main character to this island community i think something like the wicker man or uh, things you know that they have to actually travel and they get on a ferry and the ferry mm -hmm. takes them over to the island it's yep. literally a journey a transition across yep. into this yep. new setting so that's yep. very real easy way to think about it like that so if you kind of mm -hmm. get stuck there um maybe just think of something like that it's, it makes it a lot simpler yep now in some ways the second act should be an easier part of the book to write because this is where you fulfill what a lot of people like to call the promise of the premise you have a premise which is a what if scenario you know what if there was a wizarding school or you know what if dinosaurs came back to life or whatever it is and in the second act is when you you really engage that promise. You engage what that could mean, and you have fun with it. Um, the book uh, Save the Cat calls this the fun and game section. You know, this is where the clips that you would see in a movie trailer tend to be is a lot of the second act. So in some ways, this should be the fun part of writing the book, right? Uh, if you find that you're you're a little bit bored with what's going on, then you may want to ask yourself, am I really fulfilling that promise of the premise am i really engaging with that premise enough am i having enough fun with it am i exploiting it enough because it could be that perhaps you're not and uh, you might actually be letting down your audience a little bit because you built them up and they're excited for what's going to happen and you're just not quite going far enough with it yeah i think that extends to a lot of thematic content as well as something to be thought about is what is it that your story is actually talking about really under the surface and it can be for example you know if, if you're dissecting issues of family you know what does family mean what is uh the conflict within families and things like that and then you get into the middle and you're thinking this is boring there's not a lot happening here i don't really know what's going on have you just lost sight of that are the events that are happening in here actually tied into that theme at all or rather than your character actually doing things that involve family are they just walking around navel gazing and, and doing things that seem completely disconnected from again the promise of the premise uh, have you have you lost your way and become disconnected from it all exactly that's a good point keep raising the stakes um what can often happen that creates this problem of this boring sort of middle is that you have you know you have your protagonist rolling along and then you raise the stakes to get them into the second act because things got more interesting there has to be something an inciting incident to get them going and then you can just stagnate until the third act and then you decide to raise them more for the big climax that's not a great strategy you don't really want to just bring them up and just go 
straight line. Now, granted, you can't necessarily dial up to an 11, right? Because then you have nowhere to go. But you can keep, you know, keep um, tightening those screws, keep creating tension it's little by little as you get through that second act. You don't need to just get to a point and then freeze. Uh, that's not that's not a great idea. It'll just feel like the characters are just treading water. Uh, you need to give the sense that whatever the obstacle is, they're facing it and it's getting worse. Whatever they're trying is not very effective. Things like that. Uh, don't just set up the obstacle, they go off to face the obstacle, and then in the meantime, it just kind of sits there waiting for them. And then at the end of it, they face off. That's not going to be a very satisfying center. Yeah, I think enough said on that one. <laughs> 100% agree. Yeah, things things need to be constantly getting getting worse, uh, more or less. Yes. Um, or, you know, depending on, on the type of story you're writing, you know, things could be getting better. But as they're getting better, again, the stakes become uh, higher and stronger in terms of what the negative cost would be of losing right. those better things. So there's always a, a kind of push and pull on either side. Yeah. Well, that's like romance does that. The way that romance raises the stakes is that uh, the inciting incident usually brings the couple together. And then the second act is the couple falling in love with each other to the point where when the problem presents itself in the third act to be the big obstacle, um, it has a lot of at stake because they like each other. So, yeah. Uh, consider a B plot. Uh, a lot, most, not every story has one. But a lot of stories do, and there's a reason why a B plot can be helpful. Uh, B plots can uh, explore certain aspects of the character that's not particularly tied into their um, attempt to defeat this obstacle to get what they want. It could be completely unrelated to that. It could be about other characters. That helps just give you more world building. It can help, to Gareth's point earlier, earlier explore a theme. Uh, often a B plot is really where the, can, the theme can kind of lie and you can explore the theme in the B plot. But what the B plot also allows you to do is it allows you to pull the audience with a little mini story through um, the book as the main story slows down a little bit pacing wise. Because you can ramp that up, you can create maybe a little mystery to figure out or a little adventure to figure out and then drop them off on the other side. It's a tricky thing to do because as you might be thinking, well, what if the B plot is too good? <laughs> it might be really distracting, right? And then it's almost like overshadowing your air plot. Or on the flip side, well, what if the B plot just seems kind of random and thrown in? It's not going to land either. So it's tricky to do well, but it is something worth pursuing. What do you think about B plots, Gareth? Yeah, they're. I mean, they they certainly have their place, and they help to fill space if you're if you're feeling a little lost or like things are going to wrap up a little too quickly, you know, in, in terms of your main plot. Um, and also, if you seem to be getting a little bored of your main character, or you think people will get a bit too, you know, seeing too much of the main character, we just need to spend some time elsewhere. Um, I'm not the best with with really intricate subplots or B plots. I do like them, but I tend to have them still very closely aligned with the main plot because ultimately they do have to come back around and in some way meld back into the you know that that they have had some input into the resolution of the main plot um, it's not just a total side story that exists there for no reason um but uh, some people are really really good at really taking off say a b plot can be great if you've come up with a side character that you just love um and they really in that kind of case if you have developed a really great really deep um, like a really uh, intricate side character, they they kind of deserve that time as well. And I think you owe mm -hmm. it to them and to yourself to to give them their own side plot, that their own thing that they have to resolve. Um, it's just to keep yeah. an eye on bringing it back in again. Uh, but yeah, I, I tend to keep them quite closely aligned. There is things that other characters are doing on the side, but I never really head off into completely completely different areas. But um, some people do that exceptionally well. And I think it, mm -hmm. it adds a little spice, it adds a little variety, and it can keep you interested and keep you on your toes as you're writing so you don't kind of get dragged down by the sag of the middle if that's starting to hit you. So give it a try. Yeah. And depending on the genre, you can have a lot of fun with B plots, like mystery and suspense genres. Sometimes the B plots can be almost completely disconnected because 
part of the fun of reading those stories is you're trying to figure out what's going on, right? And so sometimes the authors will del deliberately throw in a B plot and you're like, I have no idea why I should care about this person or what they have to do with anything. And then the author pulls it all together. And that's part of the fun of figuring it out. Those could be really fun. Hard to yeah. write, but they're really fun when they're well done well. <laughs> uh think about try fail cycles we were kind of talking about this before with the raising of the stakes but this is a time that you get to show the audience where the protagonist is in terms of um where where their level is at in order to defeat that final obstacle and why they're not there yet so that you can see how they had to progress throughout the course of the story by the time you get to the end so a try fail cycle is pretty obvious it's a character tries to defeat something um and fails at it you know tries to get past an obstacle and fails at it and usually makes the problem a lot worse but it also just inevitably raises the stakes even if it doesn't you know make the problem worse uh it shows you that well i don't know if they're going to get past it and they really need to get past it and if it, this didn't work then what might work right and so it can uh make things a lot more interesting and give you something to do now the one thing a caveat i would say is be careful about not overusing it because you don't want character to just seem completely inept and you also don't want the audience to feel like again you're just treading water where it's just like fail 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 fail, fail just to build them up you know it, it's like a rpg game where they force you on these mindless side quests and you're like building up your xp and you're really irritated yeah don't do that but uh it can be a helpful tool try fail cycles gareth 100%. Keep an eye on them. <laughs> I think like Daniel <laughs> said, you know, it's not really, you want to find a nice balance. And I think this is something that will really help you if you're sort of struggling. Um, it's a really great tip to get a, a bird's eye view of the story and think, okay, the middle is slowing down because, and it might be uh, an issue of variety. The thing with characters that always win it's really not interesting. They're not they're not mm -hmm. being challenged. So it's like, okay, this really isn't a struggle or anything really abnormal or surprising or shocking or it's, you know, it's not hitting me in all the dramatic and entertaining ways that I expect a story to. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, when they fail all the time, like Daniel said, they start to become incompetent uh, seeming, and that's not very attractive either in a in a main character, somebody that you try to root for. Um, However, you know, some stories can be quite brutalist in that sense where they're trying their best and they're really doing their best, but fail every time by yeah. getting smacked down for things that in ways that they shouldn't have. That can work. Um, but again, that's, to that's a real tonal decision for a story that mm -hmm. turns it into something, like I said, really brutalist. But um, when you're looking at it like this, think about is your character having a bit too easy of a time or tying into the stakes as well? Uh, if they feel something that comes up later on, that's going to help with their motivations. And how can you then turn the uh, the price of failure, whatever repercussion it is that they suffer because of that, into something that forges greater motivations for them or changes the angle of motivation, if you kind of get what I mean, where they were going on a straight line towards the end of the, of the story. They were focused on the goal. Now this, this failure has caused that to shift off track a little. Well, if it's authentic and feels good, well, you can now head down that path. That's a whole more interesting place you can go and give you some more material for that middle that's fueled by something that feels legitimate, uh, that feels like a real fire uh, inside them that needs to be resolved. So that can keep you going. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, make sure you have a complete cast. This is referring to your characters. You may be getting bored because maybe you didn't put enough people in your book or you forgot about people along the way. You know, you brought them in, you introduced them, and then they're just not showing up in scenes. Uh, I do find, especially with early writers, uh, they ha have a tendency to include a lot of characters in their book, but they forget to include them in their scenes. So, like, at any given moment, you maybe have, like, two people or three people in a room, and then you have you might have a really big list of people. Well, generally speaking, I would say you might be better off to have less people overall, but more people at a given moment because it can make scenes way more interesting. But when it comes to your second act, again, when we're talking about the concept of B plots or other things, 
when you have a cast that has a diverse amount of viewpoints, you know, people that react to the same scenario in different ways, well, it gives you a lot more opportunity to take the plot in different ways and uh, to world build just so many things, uh, you know, if you and 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 I'm sure you can point to uh, books where the middle doesn't has you know, somebody in isolation, practically, it does happen. But you'll notice even books where you have that kind of concept, like uh, The Martian, for example, when you get to the second act, they start introducing a lot more of the B plot of people going and trying to get him and things like that in order to enrich the story. So it does tend to work a lot better. Yeah, I think you you'll think tend to see that. Oh, you'll tend to see that a lot in screenplays, too. Um, mm. Some of these movies that come out that are uh, purportedly about you know, it's like a single person in a small situation, a small, like trapped somewhere. That's right. what this story is about. And you think, oh, how's that going to be an hour and 40 minutes? Um, it turns out that, you know, 40 minutes of that or more is flashbacks, is yeah. going into their memories and all these things they think about. There are very few um, that are actually like that with somebody themselves. I think coming to my mind, the only one that does is Buried with Ryan Reynolds which is yeah. literally him in a box for the entire movie. Pretty much every, everyone else that I could recall right now does jump into, you know, background stuff and flashbacks and history um, that all lead up to this moment with a, with a bigger cast. Um, and I think, yeah, just being wary as well that the cast isn't spinning out of control. Um, you can have a, a really great, you know, a really great ensemble if you're thinking along the lines of you know, something like the Expendables or some action thing where you have a really great group of characters all together um, that are energetic and all individual. And they can really, it can be easy to blast through an entire story with something like that, um, as long as all the characters are lively and interesting enough. But um, you don't want to sp you know, spiraling yeah. out of control. Uh, and losing focus on the major characters, because certainly I think even of something like um, an ensemble in The Expandables or uh, Ocean's Eleven, you know, two or three of that extended group are the main point of view characters. Mm -hmm. We're the not really, forces, yeah. yeah, we're not getting entirely into everybody else. So it's a bit of a balance, but I think as long as you love the characters enough, uh, you'll be able to handle it. Yes. That's uh, so a cast that goes beyond surface level. Yeah, if you're gonna give them a lot of page count, um, you know, get into the get into them a little bit. Gareth, like Gareth said, it's a balancing act. Uh, the one, <laughs> it's kind of like the B plot problem. You don't want your secondary characters to be too boring or too interesting because if they're that interesting then people are going to wonder well why aren't they just the main character of the story and if they're too boring then people are going to wonder why they're even there so it, it's 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 tricky but it's definitely worth looking at if you find that you're um, struggling with the middle uh, here's a question about nano does it have to be a single project one book or story or can it be one to get to the word number the thing about nanorimo is that it is a tool for you they have rebels, as it were, that decide all kinds of rules, like more words or less words or whatever. Um, the point is just to get everybody excited about writing um, in November. Now, technically, if you want to follow the rules, it's 50,000 words. None of the words should have been written before November, but it does not have to be about an individual project. And I believe you're still following it in the strictest sense. Yeah, Although, I think if, again, you, if you want to, no, no, if you want to write short stories, that. just track the word count as you go. You could have uh, yep. fifty thousand words of short stories. You're, you've almost got your way to a full collection. Yep, this is another uh, point. Uh, too many characters gets confusing. Yep. Although, tell, tell that to George R. R. Martin. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shake the box. What I mean by this is. You know what? Sometimes it's really worth it to just go completely hog wild for a little bit and just kind of just go for broke. If you find that you're that you're just kind of bored, um, you know, pull up, do some brainstorming exercises, pull a random noun from the dictionary, um, go on, go on to a site of just different plot twists that come up and just try one see what it feels like you know just just see if you can just kind of mess around with things because it could just be that you know you didn't have a great way of getting your story to that next level and you're kind of just on the on the edge of the surface and if you just kind of joggled your brain a little bit you'd get that aha moment and then it'll come a lot easier it can be that's one reason why you're struggling so sometimes it is worth it to, to, to pause ask yourself is this really the best idea maybe there's something a little more interesting let's kind of you know joggle things around and and see what happens 
Yeah, this is one of a couple of activities that I actually recommend to people um, if they're sort of getting stuck in the middle of a story or getting stuck in the beginning. Because you know it's really it's really easy to get excited about something and then mm -hmm. you sit down to write it and you're like, this just will not come out. This is just not happening. <laughs> um, I'll right. see that with the rest of the tips later. Whether another another thing that I recommend is is more appropriate for for those tips, but certainly for this one, it is something I recommend. If you're just kind of getting stuck, this isn't that, or doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to actually be part of the story. It's an exercise, so shake it up. Try thinking of something just really ridiculous yeah. that can happen in that moment. You know, have your character get hit by a bus, have a you know, a drunk driver swerves off the road and plows into the front of their house or whatever building they're in in the, in the minute, uh, the moment of this scene. Uh, where are they? Can armed robbers burst in? You know, what happened? Just something right. crazy. Uh, really, really shake it up right. and run with it um, for, you know, 5,000 words, 2,000 words, whatever way before the steam runs out. It's just to get you excited and moving again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even if you don't take that premise, there, you might get some ideas from it and it might just... It might. Uh, it's like they say sometimes you deliberately just write the wrong thing because it can help you figure out the right thing. <laughs> I like um, sometimes it, it's just when I'm stuck with it, and a lot of the things I write is just throw the monster in. Yeah, you know. Yeah, just, right. <laughs> just have it have it pop up. There you go. Uh, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> more gore in our uh, more 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 horror. Yeah, exactly. And all of a sudden, yeah. Uh, <laughs> change locations. Uh, Gareth was talking about this. This is actually typically what happens in Second X. It's pretty rare you will find that characters don't actually change locations. So you probably already have this. But one thing to keep in mind is how big of a transition it is in terms of a location. Sometimes I think writers don't quite push it enough. And they don't quite change the terrain, the the well, wherever they are, the building they're in or anything like that. It's just a somewhat different version of where they were in the first act. It, try, try, to shake, try to shake it up maybe a little bit more because it might uh, really just give you a lot more energy in that part of the story, especially if this is a world building sort of story. If this is a fantasy story or science fiction. Well, it gives you a lot more of the world to talk about. So that can be a lot of fun. But imagine like it's a horror story and you're talking about people that are trapped in a space. Well, usually what happens is that space starts to take on other characteristics, right? Because it's being taken over by an evil force or something. So push that, you know, uh, have fun with that because uh, it can, like I said, really make the middle not just feel like you're stagnating from the beginning. Yeah, and I think in this sense as well, it's worth thinking about... Um... Is there anywhere that you've been that's excited you as a location that you would like to put a story in? And mm -hmm. if that comes to you or that's been sitting in your mind, but you're just not finding the right place for it, well, why not use it now? Is there some way you can get these characters to that place and make it make sense? And if you're getting stuck in the story, well, then all you need to find is a relevant story reason for that to happen and uh, bring them there, bring them over. Um, I know a, a good number of authors who are almost, well, I wouldn't say entirely or almost exclusively, but a lot uh, of their stories are inspired by the places that they live in. You know, they're just walking around, the, the, you know, in the city or the town, wherever it is, um, and they will find, they'll see lots of things, lots of places, lots of uh, landmarks and things like that to spark ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Think about those. It's like, okay, well, and if your story is fantastical, if it's a fantasy world that you've made up, um, if it's a sci-fi and they're, they're jetting around space and things like that, can you just kind of transfer a real life location that excites you into that world you know re uh, reskin it for yourself in the way you need to use it and use it um you know use the layout use everything the way it would be um anyone who's right. reading is unnecessary you know not likely to figure out oh this is this is exactly the layout of the louvre they're, they're not thinking like that you just uh, have it in your mind and to mm -hmm. you it's that place but it's uh, right. again something inside you that excites you about it so why not use it Right. And uh, even if you just want to get inspiration from it, it's like, well, what do I like about the Louvre? It's the tall ceilings. It's, the, you know, whatever it is, it's the hustle and the bustle and things like that. You can really get into <clears throat> that energy, like you said, because then if you're excited about where you're at in your creative space, well, you're probably going to enjoy writing a lot more. Yeah, um, it's like um, if picking you have... elements like that is a really good idea, too, because something like, like the Louvre, if you wanted to fit into your story as well, how can it fit? 
uh, kind of tonally and what could be in there that's a little different thing. Like uh, if that were to be a horror thing, what if there's a, a gallery where every painting has screaming people trapped inside them, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And how can I, how can I use that? So just, yeah, think about the places for inspiration. Yep. For sure. And you can use the second act as an opportunity to shake that up. So Uh, raise questions, but also give answers as something that I like to, to mention to people, especially depending on the genre. Like if you're doing like, if you're doing like a mystery genre, I do find that it works better that rather than you just keep raising questions the entire time and it's just questions, 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 questions. What's this about? What's this about? Isn't this mysterious? And you're never really, you don't never really learning anything. You're going to get very frustrated and it's just going to feel like it's treading water. You don't really have a sense of where the story could possibly be going. It doesn't work well. What tends to work better is to give answers because answers come with consequences, right? Like horror, uh, Garrett's talking, talks about horror, you know, obviously a lot of times with horror, the questions are about whatever horrific thing you're facing. Well, as you get answers, that only raises the stakes usually because it lets you know the horror that you're facing. And Garrett, you can uh, tell me a bit about that, I'm sure. Well, I think think that's, that's, that's quite true. And the thinking in the mystery sense as well is thinking about the pacing of your answers and where mm-hmm. you're giving them out. It doesn't necessarily all have to be in order. So you have, you know, initial questions posed, and then I'm right. going to answer the first of those later on. You could have right. it that you, know, you always want to be giving little answers, uh, answers to the little, littler things. <laughs> so you give me small questions as we're going and you could have, while we have three questions already loaded that we're carrying with us as this story progresses, we get a fourth question. And then just a little time later, we get an answer to that fourth question and it becomes not so mysterious. So it's not really tying as heavily into everything else as it could, but it feels rewarding. We got a quote, we got an answer to that question. And yes, you know, it, it's, it's relevant. Um, it's not completely irrelevant. Otherwise it wouldn't be in there. <laughs> so it is relevant to the plot, but it's not a huge thing. Um, and we get that little, little dopamine hit of oh yeah we got an answer the mystery is starting to unfold uh but we still have those three still hanging hanging over us from before and uh, again the answers to those may not come out in the order they were introduced to begin with i love this why is daniel wearing a viking helmet what do you mean this is what i always wear no i'm just kidding uh it's (laughs) it's like i'm not wearing a viking helmet um it's nanorimo it's a thing it started the 10th anniversary of nanorimo and um they have it as part of their logo now so it's to give you that quest for adventure i guess so that's that's what i get out (laughs) it's also fun i like i like wearing helmets He'll be drinking uh, anyway, from the I'm skulls sorry. of his I'm enemies. I'm sorry, Gareth. I completely, I completely <laughs> ram, uh, steamrolled your pithy comments with my Viking helmet. This <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's but fine. yeah, that's when fine. we're talking about we're talking about those little dopamine hits. I think the other thing too is I think readers, especially if they don't know you, let's say you're not a famous author, which if you're watching me, probably not. Uh, <laughs> they want to have a sense that you're not going to just raise a bunch of questions and then just leave them hanging, right? Uh, you're not going to pull insert whatever show or movie did that to you and you're upset about um you know people have had that negative experience where they were led on this path and they just didn't feel fulfilled so by giving the audience little answers as they go through you're giving them the idea that okay i understand I I can kind of see you as a reader. I know that when I brought this up, you thought of it as a question and I'm answering it. And so we can build this relationship and we'll continue walking together. And eventually it's all going to make sense. Right. Um, It can be very helpful from that standpoint. I like this embracing the challenges of writing like a warrior. Yes. Because clearly I'm the warrior type. In case you didn't know, I'm gonna call uh, in. I'm gonna call time. in an in joke. I'm sorry, Daniel. Where's the peaches? <laughs> I love it. So good. And if you don't know what that is, go back to drop the beat challenge, which was really fun. And we talked about story beats, and we talked a lot about the story beats for the second act. So it'd be a good one to check out. Yes, an unfinished Netflix series. Uh huh, exactly. So, I wanted to give a little shout out to some autocrit services that might help you with your uh, second act. 
uh, in different ways, especially as you're coming off of NaNoWriMo, you're going to have some work and you maybe would like people to see it, of course, but you might actually would want an expert such as Gareth or me or one of our autocrit team to look at it. Um, well, we have author services. We have our first chapter critique where we look at uh, first chapter, uh, this could be helpful because we can give you a sense of what sort of uh, promises you've made to the audience. Again, kind of going back to what I just said. And that might even give you some ideas for your second act you didn't have before. We also have our story inspections where we look through your entire story uh, from start to finish, which could be helpful because if you have a choppy second act, but you like your beginning and your end, well, you could just tell us, hey, I've got a choppy act. Take a look at it. And we'll give you advice as to maybe some things you didn't think about. And uh, to interject there as well, one thing to point out too is if you are struggling with Nano kind of right now, you know, you need some advice or ways to, to dial in beyond what we do in the, in the live streams and in a one on one setting. We have opened up extra slots too inside the Story Doctor Clinic, which you can drop in uh, anytime you'd like at autocrit.com slash Story Doctor Clinic with little dashes in between the links there on the uh, on the page. So that's uh, one on one sessions, consultations that you can book for 30 minutes to, to drop in and chat with one of us. Um, feel free to do that. You know, you don't have to wait till the end to get your full reviews and everything. So if you need a little hand just getting moving or wrapping up some things that are causing a block for you, consider that too. I'm sure if you're on our mailing list, we'll uh, drop an email to you about that shortly. Fantastic. Yep. All right. Here's something to keep in mind. Keep the antagonist ever present. And when I say antagonist, I'm referring to mechanically whatever the obstacle is that's present preventing the protagonist from what they want. Um, now, this does not mean that every chapter, every few scenes that the that this obstacle has to be physically there, has to try to interact with them or something like that. I just mean that you have a sense of that obstacle. Uh, think of like Lord of the Rings, you know, you don't ever really encounter Sauron. I mean, like for what? Like really almost ever do they ever, they don't really do like a like a, in a one-to-one -one encounter, right? It's always just this looming force, but it's ever present because you have other per personalities involved. Like you have the orcs, you have the ring race, you have all these other characters that represent the antagonist that you get to see. And this is where you get into that try-fail cycle too. Some of those uh, failures don't have to necessarily be the antagonist themselves. They can be a representation of the antagonist, something similar, a minion, something of that sort. But another way you can make the antagonist ever-present is you can have the protagonist constantly coming upon the aftermath of the antagonist. Like Especially if the antagonist is, an, is not just an obstacle um, but also a resistant force, you know, is actually uh, in um, approaching the protagonist and is absorbing things or things like that, fight, you know, is a evil monster or something, you know, they can constantly come upon the victims, the things like that. And it just keeps that antagonist ever present, even if they're not there. Yeah, I, just as you said, minion and Wendy commented, <laughs> I've got the antagonist minions minion. wrecking stuff. <laughs> yeah, good minion action. Yeah, I think keeping the antagonist ever present is is such a great uh, a great piece of advice. You, you want, once the antagonist has touched the world of your characters, it should always be looming. And I think that's a, a really great thing to, to say about Sauron as well. It's like throughout Lord of the Rings, always kind of looming above everything. You're never not thinking about Sauron. Um, even though it may be in that moment, they're dealing with orcs, they're dealing with this, you know, you know, above it all, it's just the giant eye <laughs> watching everything. So keep that exactly. in mind. When it comes to like, uh, you know, the, uh, a creature feature, like a horror story type of thing is once those, once those creatures have been introduced, whenever we come into scenes with other characters, there's always a sense of danger of threat. So they're always worried that these things are going to going to be there or the when i say they i mean the reader so you set up things like it's always threatening to be there um the character steps outside to do you know put out the trash or do a bit of work and uh there's something rustles in the bushes there's a noise there's a sound that we might uh, tie to that creature so we're always worried that even though this character has never seen the things before that something may be there watching them even though it's not, it may not be, but you're setting up the suspense, you're setting up the anxiety of that fact that the, the antagonist is ever present, 
even though it might not actually be there. Exactly. Perfect. Gareth in space. <laughs> yes. I love it. <laughs> I thought I thought of one that uh, which, whichever auto might best represent you know just kind of floating around in boredom in the boring middle and I thought well if you were kind of floating around stranded in space I guess you'd be pretty bored ah there you go for as long as you lasted yeah or it's like what is it the movie gravity that's basically all second act <laughs> like it's like <laughs> it's like this the first act is like 15 seconds and then like the third act is like a minute <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I guess you could say it's all third act. I guess it depends on how you classify it. I would think of it as all <laughs> second act, basically. But we can have that. <laughs> we could have that uh, debate. I feel like we should have. It's like a political show. We should have these debates about the stuff. So, what do you say? Is that the first? Is that the inciting incident, or is that <laughs> the inciting incident? <laughs> um, try writing some story beats. Yes. Um, you might try to beat out that second act, even if this is not something you normally do. It could be that you normally work off of a beat sheet uh, because you're a, a plotter type, you're an architect type, but maybe you're not. But this might be a good time to experiment because the second act, again, can get a little bit choppy. You may want to have more of a sense of where you're going um, on, on the second act. You could try it out. Um, the other thing, too, if you're getting a little bit stuck is maybe kind of figure out where you're at in terms of those beats. So go pull up a beat sheet and see, oh, okay, because it might give you a clue as to what should come next, right, in that typical format. So if you're at the point where, you know, it's usually the time that they face the obstacle and it escalates and you haven't done that, it's like, oh, well, I should have them face an obstacle and it should escalate and things like that. And that don't mean, you know, to think about it super formulaic, but it can just help, you know, jog your mind, get you back on track. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And so it's, I've never really been a big beat sheet kind of person. It's only in the last year that uh, I really started digging into it. And I'm digging it. I'm digging it. I quite like it. <laughs> I, I feel inadequate. My antagonist is a miserable, mean jazz drummer. I don't know. That sounds kind of cool to me. Like <laughs> a mean jazz drummer. Isn't that like the, it's like the movie Whiplash, right? Or I guess he's the coach. I've never seen that movie, but. <laughs> You've never seen, seen Whiplash. Trailer. I never oh, it's, have. It's tremendous. I know it's so good. It's one of those movies like I really want to see, but I've just never seen it. Just for no reason except I just haven't seen it. But yes, I do want to see it. But yeah, I mean, isn't that that's in the antagonist and that is a musician, right? And so it can yeah, totally he's, work. he's the uh, the the teacher, the um, yeah maestro, more or less. Yeah, exactly. Um, keep your character motivation up front. This is something we always like to say. You might, it might seem like a broken record, but it really does help. It really helps, uh, because sometimes you can get overthinking about story and plot and structure and all that. And you can just forget, like, what does my character actually want right this moment? You know, who's in the most pain, uh, is something I always like to ask myself, you know, who is struggling the most right this moment? Because then you can start speaking to that, right? And especially if you're just kind of stuck that moment, just keeping in mind, you know, what's what do they care about most right this second? And it could be all they care about right that second is that they want to eat because it's been a while. Well, that still gives you something to write about and keeps keeps those uh, gears turning, right? And uh, could be very helpful to get you out of a writing block moment. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think it ties back to the that element of failure and things as well as always be thinking about the driving motivations. And you know, it's one of these these things too. People, it's become a bit of a joke because it is kind of stereotypical, but it's true. It's a stereotype because it is very true. Um, actors on a movie set, you know, there's that mm -hmm. big joke where somebody's just going, what's your "This actor standing there going, well, what's my motivation?" You know, I don't quite get it. And th there's a lot of comedy to be found in something like that, and people have done it really well. But it's true. It's one of these things. Like I'm trying to understand what is driving the character through this event, so we can find an authentic way for it to resolve, or for the things for them to do, or ways for it to go. Um, I always recommend is 100% in any scene is understanding character motivation, uh, what it is that's propelling them through that event. And if you lose track of that, it's very easy to get lost. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, because it is it is a bit of a cliche, like as a joke, you know, like you said, the whole, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. But usually the joke in those moments is that 
well, what they should be doing is kind of obvious because it's right there on the page, right? So <laughs> the, this is a situation where maybe you've lost the point and you're kind of like that actor and you're like, well, I don't even know what their motivation is. But if you just kind of think about it and you're like, well, let's say I was trapped on a desert island like my character and there's a wolf monster chasing me. Well, this would be kind of the what would be going in my mind, right? Um, and sometimes you, you, we can lose a little bit track of that. We can get a little bit too much in the pros and making things sound nice. And like I said, making sure you hit those story boxes that you can lose your sense of your your character for sure. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point there, sitting by yourself. I'll always recommend a, an element of kind of role play there as well. If you're feeling a bit lost or a bit stuck in a scene, whatever, try, just try, see how far you can kind of drop into the character, almost act them yourself sitting there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're doing that and you're role playing it and you're thinking, it's like, well, okay, what's actually happening in this scene and what they're dealing with doesn't actually matter that much to them right now. You know, you kind of find that authentically when you role play what their mindset is and what they're dealing with and what they're looking for is that, well, I've put them in a situation that doesn't really matter and this needs to be something different. So you might mm -hmm. wind back a bit and uh, give something a bit more higher stakes. This is an interesting point. Are some of these points observable in a meta way while watching a trilogy? Yes, it can be. Not all trilogies operate like this, but yes, certainly there are lots of trilogies where the second part of it kind of uh, ends up feeling like, I don't want to say like a rehash that's too negative, but it often feels like there's a certain amount of stagnation while it transitions to what will change a lot in the third book. Uh, like Hunger Games is a great example like that. The second book it is a very similar scenario to the first one, but the author raises the stakes. And then by the end of the second book, the entire uh, rules of engagement are changed. Or if you think of Harry Potter, uh, this is not a trilogy, but books two through six, very similar structurally. And then JK Rowling breaks it at the end of the sixth book. And you end that book and you're like, well, the seventh book can't be formatted at all like the other ones. So it is, it is something that definitely happens in series for sure on a different sort of scale. Good question. Uh, turn to the middle of your favorite book uh, and get inspiration. Try that, you know, in terms of sometimes uh, what we'll remember about books are their really great setups, their really great endings, and we'll forget about the middle because uh, perhaps the middle is where things kind of slow down. Although, like I said earlier, often the middle is where you have that promise of the premise uh, fulfillment. So you can have a lot of the classic scenes in the middle of the book, but you can also sometimes have the scenes that are difficult to write. And I always like to tell uh, authors, don't just study the, the scenes that you really love and stood out to you because they're just the set pieces. Study the boring scenes. Study the scenes where they were sitting at a kitchen table talking about their life or they're sitting around a conference table talking about the plans for the business or things like that. Scenes that you would have thought would have been dreadfully boring and worked because it can give you some clues as to do those scenes yourself. Because it's a lot easier to do, you know, tremendously fun uh, sequences when you have a good hook. You know, you're like, well, what if, you know, people could fly? It's like, oh, I could think of a, a bunch of action sequences that would be really fun with flying people. That's not going to help you figure out how to do the scene where they're sitting at a diner talking about their personal life or something like that. You know what I mean? It's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of this, uh, I think um, if you really want to go kind of whole hog in, into this too, I, I do recommend picking some of your favorite books out and just sitting down and actually deconstructing them um, chapter mm -hmm. by chapter, scene by scene. Write it out, lay it out, do it on a spreadsheet if that is what works for you. And lay out the content in order of how that story is unfolding so you can actually see the sequence of events um, and what's being presented and um, really think deeply about each one is uh you know you go back so if something feels almost nondescript like two characters sitting in a room together talking what happened in that scene why did it work what was the purpose break that down for every single scene for yourself as well it would only take uh, well i think three four books before you start to actually see what's going on uh structurally between them this kind of in common in the middle and what things how things matter i like this comment because um this is something i often talk about in the middle of a story I had the protagonist somewhat worried they said what's the worst that could happen to him so they said do that and more 
so yeah, exactly. I'm gonna block this uh, spam. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> But yeah, exactly. Uh, there's an old adage I've heard, which is act one, you get your protagonist up a tree. Act two is you throw rocks at them. And act three is you chop the tree down. Uh, but essentially, that, that's, yeah. The act two is often when you get to beat up on your uh, protagonist. And to Garrett's point earlier, you get to decide what level of brutalist you want to be. You can just be like, yeah, you know, just throw it all at them. But, uh, but definitely uh, be willing to go there as much as you're comfortable with, especially based on the genre. Uh, definitely go for it. Uh, because it, uh, it, you don't want to, you don't want it, to, it's kind of the promise of the premise all over again. There's a certain amount of a uh, setup that promises we're going to have a lot of fun. But again, getting back to the stakes of that inciting incident leading to the call to adventure, there's a reason why the protagonist wouldn't just be like, Okay, let's go ahead and do it. There was a, there was a, there were stakes to that decision to get themselves involved, and so now you're starting to pay them off, right? And that's going to continue to escalate till you get to that break at the uh, third act where it, where things really go south. Go for it. You can change it in editing. Yes, that's always a good strategy. <laughs> Fix it in post. <laughs> Fix it in post. Uh, and finally, I know Sumi seem like a cheat, but consider skipping some of these parts. I don't mean never include them in your book, please. Don't do that. But especially in the context of NaNoWriMo, these might be some of the scenes that, for productivity's sake, if you want to get to that 50,000 words, if you want to get going, you may you may just need to kind of skip over them because maybe it's just not in you to write that let's get the chess pieces in, in a row sort of scene because uh, it's a little boring to you and maybe you're not sure or maybe you're feeling like you're just going to change it later anyway because you want to see, well, what happened and then we'll figure out how we got into that situation. Fair enough. Especially if you're pantsing, I could totally see doing that because it's like, I want to go to the fun set pieces and then I'll figure out how they got from place to place, you know. Um, I could see doing that for sure. But you can consider doing it. It's not the end of the world. Nobody says that you have to write a book in linear order. And in fact, that's never going to happen because even if you do write your first draft like that, I can guarantee you on your rewrite, you're going to bounce around because you have to because you're going to make adjustments and then you're going to have to go to specific scenes. So do not feel that there's anything wrong. It's not really cheating to skip past, it might just be the most productive thing to do. Do you ever uh, skip past some of this, uh, Gareth, when you're writing, just for the sake Yeah, of sometimes if getting stuck, I'll do the old placeholder thing, uh, just mm -hmm. drop a placeholder in there and move on, yeah. things like we uh, talked about last week. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. And the another thing I recommend sometimes as well is if the frustration is really getting to you, sometimes step outside of the story. Um, not entirely, but bring your mind back and think about what it was that initially excited you about this idea. Uh, mm. What was it that came to you? Was it a scene? Uh, was it an image? Uh, was it a place perhaps something somewhere you were that you were looking around and thought this would be really great for uh, a story setting. What was it? And write about that mm. uh, just to bring yourself back into the vibe because it can really start to drag you down with something you were excited about. just doesn't seem to be coming out. Um, and that can be in any kind of format too. For example, if it was a location, if it was somewhere you were looking at and you thought, I really want to write about this place and I'm going to put it into this story, but again, it's not quite working. It can be um, like a, a second person exploration, you know, just write something as you, you, know, you step out the front door of the hotel in front of you, the bustling streets or blah, blah, blah. And, and point out the details, point out the things about that place that gave you that idea that initially struck you. Just do that as an exercise and, and see if that can help bring you back into, into the flow of things and kind of reignite what it is that you initially wanted to, to tell. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. And uh, you might um, <clears throat> consider, you know, I know people bring up like their inspiration boards and things like that. And that's that can be helpful, you know, uh, don't want to get too sucked into something like that, but you know, have like a, a a Pinterest board or something, and you just throw a lot of stuff in there, and it's like, oh, this is what you know, this is what's getting me excited about this concept for sure. All right, well, Gareth, you mentioned another thing that w I don't think I ever touched on. So, do you want to bring up your other exercise that you were talking about earlier? The one that the was the one. Tank. And I, I oh, thought that it was, was more, it. I thought it was oh, more appropriate mind. for this point, so that was good. Oh, I should have. <laughs> I should have. I see. I didn't connect it. That was my bad. 
There we go. See, and we had it all planned out, right? And I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> So smooth, Daniel. So smooth. All right. So, yes, for those of you who are AutoCrit members, uh, we are doing little checkpoints, uh, pit stops, we call them, for this race of NaNoWriMo every five days. So that means uh, tomorrow, the 10th, we will be doing another one. And again, this is for AutoCrit members. If you want to find out how to join us, we'll check it out in the community in uh, Mighty Networks. And uh, if you're not an AutoCrit member, well, become an autocrit member and you can join us on those and they're really fun we check in we figure out where everybody's progress is at we uh troubleshoot a little bit and then we have a awesome write-in with whatever random music i want to play given my mood at that moment you just never know it's, it's fun i might do polka tomorrow we'll find out <laughs> <laughs> hardcore german rave thank you for the five day check-ins guys yay yes awesome Awesome, awesome. All right. Uh, any other comments, Gareth, about the middle before we wrap this up? No, I think these have been uh, pretty all-encompassing. I think if you keep everybody, you know, keep these in your back pocket anytime, just try one or the other, whatever uh, kind of situation is facing you, and I think you'll find the answer. I think you'll find your way through. Um, keep it up, and uh, yeah, there's many more days to go still, so don't get too uh, too forlorn. Yes, exactly. So we will be back here on YouTube at one o'clock on Tuesday. And if you haven't yet, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. If you know any, if you have any writer friends, send them our way. We're always producing content here on this YouTube channel. And uh, it's really fun. It's fun to be able to interact with all of you. And I'm so excited and impressed like seriously impressed with some of these numbers I'm seeing. They're making me feel really unproductive. Uh, maybe you should be in this chair giving us some tips because, wow, some of these numbers, woo! <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next Tuesday, all right? Take care, everyone.